Well, if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to get them open to James chapter 1 this morning. James chapter 1, where for the last few weeks, James has been helping us learn that there are times when God uses difficult circumstances to test our faith for the purpose of making us spiritually mature and more like Jesus Christ. You guys remember what we call those difficult times in our lives? Trials, that's right, okay? We have been talking about trials and those times of testing that God uses always for our good. But this morning, we're going to shift gears just slightly, all right? Because as James continues writing, he mentions that there's another type of pressure that comes into our lives. Only this one is not for our benefit, but it's actually out to hurt us. Something that we have to be prepared to survive. And we call these negative testings of our faith temptations. You all know what a temptation is? Well, temptation is how, this is how we're going to define it this morning, just to make sure we are all on the same page. It's this. A temptation is an opportunity to accomplish a good thing, but in a bad way, out of the will of God. Temptation is the opportunity to accomplish a good thing, but in a bad way, out of the will of God. Maybe the easiest way I can kind of help you get a hold of that and be able to make sure that you understand that is to think back to your school days. You guys remember as you start especially get down toward the end of the year like many of our students are right now, end of school becomes all about one thing, test. Lots and lots and lots of test. You guys remember that? Yeah, not a whole lot of fun. A lot of pressure there on you as a student because you want to be able to pass all those tests and you want to be able to finish well. But, were you ever given the opportunity, maybe just even sitting there, and you saw somebody sitting in front of you and you saw their answers and you thought, hmm, that looks a little better than mine. That seems to make a little more sense. And you had the opportunity right then to do a good thing, to pass your test, but to do it in a bad way, called cheating. That is what a temptation is all about. And James brings this up, and you're probably kind of wondering, you know, why all of a sudden go from trials to temptations? You know, why does James make this switch kind of right in the middle of the flow of what he's talking about? But really it comes down to this. Under pressure, like what we find ourselves many times in when trials come into our lives, we find ourselves actually tempted to abandon God's faith-building program of joyful perseverance and instead opt for shortcuts. Get out of the pressure. Get away from it. Stop short what God is doing just because we want relief. And we want that immediately. Problem being, when those temptations come along, they provide absolutely devastating consequences. And we've got to be prepared for them. If we're going to survive them, and we're going to be able to benefit and become as much like Christ as what we possibly can. I'd like to begin today by kind of giving you an illustration that I think will help you understand just how dangerous temptation can become. I grew up in a place called Holland, Michigan. And Holland is home to a lighthouse that you're going to see up here in just a minute that's called Big Red. Pretty obviously as to why that's the case. The Big Red sits at the intersection of Lake Michigan and a smaller inland lake right there. It is an absolutely gorgeous place to visit. It's, you can walk right out on the pier there. You can see Lake Michigan for absolutely miles. You can look back. You can see the beach and everything. Thousands of people every single year take that walk out there just to kind of look around and be able to see not only the lighthouse, but to be able to get a glimpse of the lake and just the beauty that it has there. Absolutely gorgeous place. 
but also an extremely dangerous one. You see, the force of the wind pushing those waves into the pier create an effect called undertow. Water comes in, smashes in there, and immediately it starts to suck down. And that's exactly what undertow is all about. There's no way you can get away from it. But it's this pull that happens, and there's all this swirling that goes on, and it will drag anything that's stuck in it down. That pull is so strong, it is almost impossible to get out of without the help of someone from the surface. And yet, despite the obviously dangerous waters, and all the signs that are posted all over the place, prohibiting people from swimming there, People ignore those warnings and they jump in to swim. Some are lucky enough to get pulled out by somebody else. Others, they disappear beneath that water and you don't ever see them alive again. In fact, on average, one person every single year needlessly drowns off of that pier right there. They get on, caught in the undertow and they disappear under the waves and that's it. They're gone. But that's what temptation is like. Temptation is like those swirling waters around the pier there at Big Red. They look exciting, but the undertow it can kill you. And knowing this, James is going to give us some very straight talk about temptation this morning. That if heeded, is going to actually help us be able to survive the danger that temptation can bring to our lives. And so let's look at what James teaches us about the need this morning for truth and accuracy when it comes to surviving temptation. James chapter 1, I'm going to pick things up in verse 13 and read down through verse 18 just to kind of give us a feel for the passage that we're going to be exploring together today. Follow along in your Bible. James chapter 1, beginning with verse 13, it says this. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be kind of firstfruits of his creatures. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to open up your word this morning. We thank you for all that you have been teaching us here over the last several weeks about how it is that we can not only survive the tough times in life, but how we can actually thrive through those. And Lord, as we kind of, again, just shift gears a little bit this morning, and we move away from just those times of trial, those times of testing that are there that we know are for our good, and we talk about temptation, I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to, again, have hearts that are ready to receive your word, but also to be able to look very deeply into ourselves. Because temptation is real. We all face it. We all have it. And we need to be prepared for it. So, Lord, I pray that you would use your word just to, again, awaken our senses and help us to be able to understand just the danger that this thing called temptation poses in our lives. And how it can deter us from becoming everything that you want us to be in Jesus Christ. But then, Lord, that you'd also equip us through your word with the tools that you say are there for us. In order to be able to not only, again, survive temptation when it comes our way. But to be able to thrive in it for your honor and for your glory. So, Lord, just bless this time that we have now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, y'all ready? Sure? Okay. First lifeline James throws to us to help us survive the undertow of temptation is this. He says we need to get clear about the source of temptation. 
We need to get clear about the source of temptation. Because the lie that we are all tempted to believe at different times in our lives, especially when life gets hard, is this. I'm not responsible for my sin. Not my fault. You ever said that? Or at least thought it? And James says that is so far from the truth. Because as he's going to show us, the Word of God teaches us very clearly, God tempts no one, and the problem exists inside of me. So notice James begins with a very sharp rebuke for those who are looking to find an easy excuse for their wrongdoing. And he tells us in verse 13 this, he says, Don't even begin to think about blaming God. You see it? He says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted for God, by God. Because God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no man. God himself, the word of God tells us, is untemptable. He is so holy. He is so righteous. He is so perfect that there is not a single thing that evil can do to make the slightest appeal to God. Think about that for a minute. How much we struggle with what is wrong and what is evil. Well, guess what? Evil to God is like vegetables are to most kids. They're not going to even consider it no matter how hungry they are. And James says, furthermore, God would never tempt, I'm sorry, would never do anything to tempt you. Because remember, temptation is the opportunity to sin. God and sin, they are so far apart from each other. And God would have nothing to do with sin, and he would never lead you to do something that is wrong and out of his will. That is totally against his nature. And it is totally against his purpose for each of us of his children. When God sends Jesus into your life, he does so to save you and to rescue you from sin. He wants to help you grow to become as much like his perfect son, Jesus Christ, that you possibly can. So yes, God does test us in our faith to make us better. But James makes very clear, God does not tempt our faith to make it weaker. And that's why the warning here. James warns us, he says, just don't go there. Don't blame God. He's not the problem when it comes to you staying out of the undertow of temptation. Instead, he goes on to identify the true source. And he says something that might be surprising to some of you. See it in verse 14? He says, but each person, okay, so we're talking about all of us here this morning, right? Got that? He says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed, what's it say? By his own desire, or some of you have the word lust there. Can I put that another way for you? The source of temptation is not external things. It's not about your circumstances. It's not about your stuff. It's not about God. It's not about other people even. But it's rather about your own eternal desires. In fact, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Take your finger and point to yourself. Right now. And here's what you need to tell yourself because this is the truth. The problem is inside of me. I'll say that together. The problem is inside of me. You guys see that, right? That's what the Word of God tells us. He says, we are lured and enticed by our own desires. The reason we struggle with temptation is because each of us has desires that reside inside of us. Now, I've got to stop here for just a minute. How many of you have the word lust there in verse 14 in your Bibles? Okay. Not a bad translation. And the idea behind it is trying to help us understand that it's the evil desires inside of us that end up, we act on, and we end up moving towards sin in, all right? But actually the word is more neutral than that. 
Because that word that's translated desires or lust, it actually refers to any longing that we have in us, whether that longing is good or whether it's evil. Because you need to understand most of the desires that you have, they are normal and they are necessary to life. For example, your desire to eat is a good thing. You've got to fuel your bodies. You've got to have energy. You've got to be able to get up and be able to do the things that your body demands of you. Your desire to sleep, that's a good thing, all right? Your body would get overly fatigued if you did not to have time to rest. Even something like sex is necessary and can be good because it's part of what God has put in us in order for the human race to continue. Desires are not necessarily bad in and of themselves. The problem comes when we have those desires and we try to satisfy those desires in wrong ways outside of the way that God has intended for them to be used. Eating. That can become gluttony, can it? We take in too much. Rest. That can become laziness. Sex outside of marriage can become immorality. Even work, something God said is good and should, we should have a desire for. He says that can become greed. Because the problem is, again, in here. And when given the opportunity, our desires seek to lure us or to draw us out the Word of God says, and entice us to do what is wrong. Those two words there, lure and entice. Kind of interesting ones. And I think ones that a lot of you will probably connect with. Because they are actually terms from the world of sports. That first one, lure or draw out, is actually a hunting term in the first century. It's used of baiting a trap. I don't know if any of you have ever trapped before. But guess what? You just don't put that trap out there and open it up and hope something's going to step in it, all right? You put something there, something that's going to be attractive to an animal, and you put it just outside of their reach so that they have to step in and they have to get caught by it. That word draw out is actually a fishing term. Absolutely no fisherman in the world is going to be successful if he goes out there and he just drops a hook in there with absolutely nothing on it and says, Woo! I didn't catch anything today. I wonder why. Well, duh. <laughs> Got to have a bait, right? You put something appealing there. Something that a fish that's hiding under here is going to look at and think, Woo! Hoo, hoo, hoo. I'm going to sneak on out. I'm going to check that out a little bit. And then hopefully, whoo, grab it. James says that's exactly how our desires work and how temptation works. It puts a bait in front of us that appeals to our desires, all the while concealing the consequences that come when we choose to fulfill a natural desire in a wrong way. And temptation... It can come in a thousand different forms, can it? I mean, you might find yourself going through a grim time in your marriage. Things are hard. Things are not working well. Trial. And along comes someone of the opposite sex who seems really interested in you. And really willing to listen. And seems to really care about you. And all of a sudden, you find yourself looking at the temptation. It's natural to want to be loved, isn't it? It's natural to want to be accepted and appreciated. But it is wrong to let an illicit relationship to fulfill that desire. You might find yourself in a tight spot financially. And you go out to the mailbox one day, and you open up this little piece of paper in there, and it says, Woohoo! credit card, no interest for a year, and you're thinking, yeah, got it. 
Because we all have desires in us for financial freedom, don't we? We don't want debt. But the instant way out may not be the best way out of your money problems. As there's almost always a catch to those offers. Or young people. Someday you're going to meet a guy, you're going to meet a girl, and that person's going to get your blood pumping a little bit. And to get his or her attention, you might be willing to say some things about yourself that cast yourself in a little bit of a better light, but aren't necessarily true. It's natural to be liked, want to be liked by people, but it's wrong to make yourself out to be something that you're not. Temptation. And James says every single one of us at some point in our existence and probably more frequently than we would like are going to be tempted. Especially when life gets tough. And I got to tell you right now there is no running and there is no hiding from temptation because the source of temptation is always present inside of you. And that means if we're going to survive temptation, we've got to stop blaming God. We've got to stop blaming other people. We've got to try to not put the pressure on things or circumstances for the sin that we commit. We've got to learn to take responsibility for our choices, especially the wrong ones. And James says the only way that that is going to happen is when we get clear about the source of temptation. That's the truth. That's where we need to be accurate if we're going to survive temptation. James doesn't stop there. He goes on and says the second way that we avoid the undertow of temptation is this. We also need to get clear about where temptation leads. Because again, this is where we sometimes get caught up in a lie. And we think to ourselves, sin, temptation, not really that big a deal, right? I mean, as long as I don't hurt anybody, I can handle it. And it's going to be okay. And yet the Word of God tells us temptation is the first step in a process with a devastating result. I think we often think of sin as kind of being like one single act, don't we? I mean, it happens so quickly that we don't really think about the fact that it can actually be broken down into a process. Because that's how God sees it. And James began outlining that process for us actually back there in verse 14. He tells us there again, he says, Each person is tempted. You have that opportunity to do a good thing, and, but in a bad way, out of the will of God. When? He says, when you're lured and you're enticed by your own desire. Again, temptation begins with natural desires. But the bait is put in front of us to deceive us into fulfilling that desire in a wrong way. I've got to stop here for just a minute. And I think it's important that we understand this. Up to this point, nothing wrong or sinful has actually been done. I have met people in my lifetime who have felt so incredibly guilty that they feel tempted. I'm sorry, but you're going to be tempted in this world. That's the reality of it. You have those desires inside of you. It's not necessarily wrong to be, be tempted, but you need to be aware of what could happen next. Because James goes on and he continues to outline that process for us in verse 15, only this time he changes the injury. I'm sorry, the emergy. I can't talk, all right? And uh, he moves from the sports world to talk of pregnancy. Notice what he says. Verse 15, he says, The desire 
when it is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth, what's it say? Death. Kind of an interesting change. That word conceive, though, is a pretty powerful one. It literally means to take together. As James talks about how desires are appealed to, the bait's put out for them to do the wrong thing, to get satisfied in the wrong way. He says, what happens is we begin to go to work. And our minds start to think, okay, this is what I want. This is what I can have. How do I put those two things together? We want to mate our desire with the temptation. And James says when that happens, something gets born. The child of bringing together desire and bait, he calls sin. We actually do what God says is wrong. Pictures it like a little baby. Only it's not a cute one. Because he says it grows up and it becomes death. You following it? Just to make sure you are, let me put this up here in a diagram so you guys can see this. This is the process that every single one of us battle against Every single day. We've got desires. Temptation puts a deception in front of us. Says this is what you can have. This is how you can have it. Only it hides the consequences. Our sinful natures go to work. Thinking how can we make this all happen. We design a plan. which leads to disobedience, which eventually leads to death. And all of that happens in a matter of seconds. We honestly don't even think about it usually, do we? But that's part of the reason James is bringing this out. Because he's highlighting for us this. A huge problem for most of us is we never stop to consider where temptation may lead. And that's why James crystallizes it for us. Because he says if we let it, temptation always becomes sin. We do what is wrong in God's sight and sin always results in death. There is no way around that. Now, I've got to be honest with you all. There's a matter of debate over what James means by death in this passage. Some people say he's talking about physical death. Some people say he's talking about spiritual death. I've got to be honest, I don't think either one of those fit the context. Because the only one that really makes sense to me is when he's talking about death, he's actually referring to the consequences that result from our sinful choices. You overeat, there's consequences to that, isn't there? Called poor health, being overweight. You get involved in an illicit relationship, you got stress on your marriage. You could be heading towards a divorce. You could be breaking apart a family. There's consequences to not nipping that temptation in the bud. You don't use credit properly, guess what? At some point, you're going to be paying high interest rates and you're going to be in worse debt than what you were before. You pretend to be someone you're not, eventually, that's going to come out and people are going to know the truth. The truth. 
You see, James is trying to get across to us this. He says, when we feel tempted to do something that we know is wrong, he says, we've got to learn to stop and to consider the consequences of that wrong action. Because it's not necessarily wrong to be tempted. You can't help that. But it's between deception and design that we've got to cut temptation off before it goes any farther. Because if we don't, we get sucked into the undertow. And you ain't coming back up alive. There's going to be problems that result from that. James gives us one final truth, though, for surviving temptation safely. And he tells us, lastly, we need to get clear about who God is. And this one, I think, is sometimes the hardest. Because we like our sin. We like how it makes it feel. We like sometimes the results, at least on the immediate. And so when God tells us not to do something, our sinful natures start to figure out this. God's got to be holding out on me, right? And why should I not play the lottery? I'm going to be rich, right? Why should I not get involved in an illicit sexual relationship? It's going to feel good, right? God's holding out on me. James says, here's the truth. God is always good, and he always has his best in mind for you. He actually starts a section with a warning there in verse 16. And he says this, he says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. He cares about us. He cares that we get this right. It's easy to think about temptation in the wrong ways. But at the same time, it's also very easy to think about God in the wrong ways. And he doesn't want us to be in the dark about that. And so he goes on in verse 17 and he tells us something very, very important. He tells us God is always good, so good in fact, that we don't need anything that temptation tries to offer us. You see it? Verse 17, he says this, he says, Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In other words, all that God is able to give out to us is good and perfect. That's it. He can't do otherwise. And that's from the way that he gives it to the content that he gives. There's never any fine print. There's never any catches with God like there is with temptation. And James says the things that God gives us are constantly coming to us. Those words, coming down, they are in the Greek language what is called a present participle, indicating continuous action. In other words, God is just giving to you and giving to you and giving to you and giving to you and everything that he gives to you, it's good and it's perfect. It can never be otherwise. And then get this. There's no way that he's going to stop giving us good things because he can't change. He says at the end of the verse, there's no variation and there's no shadow due to change in God. In other words, he is consistently always the same in who he is and how he gives to us. And who is he? He's good. Totally, 100% all the time, never going to be different, good to you. And the reason James brings all this up is this. The goodness of God is an important barrier between us and temptation. Temptation. 
Because guess what? If you're doubting God's goodness to you all the time, temptations, appeals are going to be very, very hard to resist. You're always going to find yourself just wanting to live for the moment and live to please yourself, and you're going to end up reaping the consequences of sin. But if you are confident in God's goodness, you are so much more likely to resist the urge to satisfy your desires in the wrong way. Maybe one of the best examples of this I can give you you guys remember back in the Old Testament, a guy by the name of King David? And remember, for all the good that David did, he chose to have an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba just the one time. He took the bait. And a lot of times we hear that story and we think about how beautiful Bathsheba was, you know, and how David, you know, was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we want to put all those outward external circumstances as being the reason why David did what he did. Do you know why David did what he did? Because he had a problem inside of him. And part of that problem was he doubted the goodness of God. I don't have time to take you guys to this, but scribble down 2 Samuel chapter 12. Go there and read that later today, and you will find that when the Nathan prophet actually comes in to, D to David, and he confronts David and says, David, you're the man. You have sinned. You have done what is wrong. One of the first reasons he lists for why David did that, he said, God has given you so many blessings, and you just turned your back on every single one of them. You forgot about them. And you wanted what God hadn't given you because it didn't belong to you because it really wasn't good for you, David. And guys, the same is true for us. We want to stay away from temptation. We want to stay out from the undertow. You have got to get through your heads. God is good and he is good to you all the time. No matter what it is that comes your way, it's always the best that he has to offer you. And if you ever got any questions about that, James says in verse 18, all you got to do is look at your salvation. He says, of his own will, talking about God, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures. And we're sticking with the whole birthing imagery, what's going on there. But this time he's talking about spiritual birth. He's talking about what God has done for us and saving us from our sin. And he says, first of all, he says that's an act of God's will. He didn't have to do it, but he chose to do it out of his grace and his purpose for you. Just remind you all again, you don't get saved because of your relatives. You don't get saved because of the resolutions that you might have. You don't get saved because of your religion. You get saved because God does a miracle inside of you and that's 100% totally his doing because he's good and he cares about you. He always accomplished that through his word of truth. It says there in verse 18, because it's always God's word that sets us free when we believe it and we obey it. Because it's only the word of God that's going to tell you the truth. You are a sinner heading to destruction. Apart from Jesus Christ. God's son, who sacrificed himself in your place in order to rescue you from your sin and to change you and to give you the opportunity to have new life and salvation and rescue. And James says it's through salvation that God has made it possible for us to never, ever have to give in to this thing called temptation and to sin. We are actually free from it and the power that it has of us through the power of Jesus Christ. That's the goodness of God towards you. And that's what enables James to close out the section by laying out a challenge. The challenge to be an example of how to handle temptation correctly. 
Because he says there at the end of verse 18, he says that, okay, here's the purpose. Here's the reason why God acted to save us, bring us forth, give us new life, to make us born again. He says that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That word's first fruits, you might have heard it in the Old Testament before. And really what it talks about is the beginning of harvest season, a farmer would bring a sheath of grain from the first cutting of that harvest and he would give it as an offering to the Lord. And it was the first part of the harvest that was still to come. And it signified that harvest was actually a gift from a good God and that farmer was thankful and he was looking forward to that harvest that was still down the road. And James takes that image and he reminds his first readers there, again, who were Jewish believers there in the first century. And he says, I just want to remind you, you guys are among the first believers in Jesus Christ that God has saved. And that meant the way that they responded to temptation and to trials, that was going to set a precedent for every other single Christian in later generations that was to follow. And James says, be that example. Be those first fruits. And I understand we aren't first century believers in Christ here today. But do you realize your testimony for Christ during trials and temptations still is of the utmost importance? How you respond in trusting and showing the goodness of God when life is tough is either going to point people to God or going to point people away from Him. And our world needs to see Jesus in us when tough stuff in our life comes against us. Bottom line is this. You and I, we need to respond correctly to trials and temptations so that we can become spiritually mature and so that we can show Christ to others. And with that, the first section of James is done. I don't know what tough stuff in life you're facing today. But I do know one place you don't need to go is the undertow of temptation. When we get the truth, the truth about where temptation comes from, where it leads, who God is when temptation knocks on our doors, it makes it possible for us to survive temptation. And again, the bigger message of James 1 is this. No matter whether it's trials, whether it's temptations that come your way, God says it is possible for us to survive and to thrive in the tough stuff of life. Let's make sure we're doing it. Let's make sure we're pointing people to him and how we respond. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word today. Help us to stand strong against temptation. May it be for your honor and for your glory so people see Jesus in us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name this morning. And all God's people said,